Hello again. It is the build up to D Day week still here on World War II TV. We talked about aerial reconnaissance yesterday with Alex Burnham, and today we are talking about training for D Day. And my guest is Ben Main, uh, who has been on numerous World War II TV shows. So good evening, Ben. Oh, I muted you. Hang on. That's my well, hello, Ben. Sorry. Yeah. Good evening, Paul. Good to be back. So we we talked about doing this show and we said oh well we'll look into training and actually what we found is there isn't a huge amount written down about the training for dd other than there's lots of comments in memoirs saying we didn't like the training or we were moved around the country doing training but actually pinning down what the programs were who went through what has proved to be more difficult than we thought it was going to be uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, the dip samples in war diaries that I've been through, your infantry, uh, there's not a lot of detail breaking down your usual activities that you'd expect the infantry to be doing, soldiering day to day. But then you look to the other side of it, the commandos, there's a lot more detail in their archive files on the, their training that we'll, we'll come to later on. Yeah, so it, it, it's, you know, we've we, we put together certainly enough for an hour, probably enough for considerably more than a, an hour. So we've got, we've put some images and some films together. I had to have to thank World War II TV regulars, Jim and Nick, for providing some footage of some of the sites that we'll be showing you later on. So we'll, we'll kind of leap in and we are, we are happy to be corrected by people who are watching this. If people have more information about some of these areas or some of these specific training programs, we, we are, we are happy to receive it because, you know, I, I just sat as Ben sat and I looked, went through book after book after book, thinking I would find lots of exciting quotes and coming up rather short. But what we seem to have worked out is is we're going to have to start at Dieppe. We have to start at the lessons learned at Dieppe. Now, we're accepting, of course, that Operation Jubilee was a lot more than just practicing for d-day that's one of the things that annoys me when it gets it was meant to be a raid it had its purposes and we're not going into that tonight but clearly post dieppe there were some things that the allies discovered could be done better so this is a document you provided us ben so explain basically what the main lessons that have been learned at dieppe were yeah it was interesting to to look at this and dieppe always crops up when you talk about Operation Overlord uh, and what took place back in the uh, well, 19th of August uh, in uh, 42 on those beaches at Dieppe. This report gives you an insight. And as I read through it, it was kind of a checklist, uh, really. If you look through Operation Overlord, Operation Neptune and the planning for that, uh, it, it literally was. They were ticking the boxes of the lessons learned to make sure that things were implemented ready uh, for the uh, 6th of June itself. Uh, as you can see from the document, things such as overwhelming fire support uh, and uh, close-in support for the uh, soldiers that would be landing directly onto those beaches. So constant uh, fire to suppress the enemy in fixed positions that also leads uh, on from pre-bombardment as well uh, and since we're talking about the training these are things that the navy would actively be doing and did do during the training exercises uh, combined arms uh, in preparation for overlord so it's all being implemented in those uh, training uh, exercises for the British Canadians uh, and Americans. Uh, the, there's multiple points uh, on there to go through, such as tanks should not be landed until the anti-tank defences have been destroyed or cleared. Uh, in reality, the, to go back to the pre-bombardment, that's clear. That was the intention to knock out the Vidastan nests, the strong points along the coast where they would be landing. But in reality, we know that that didn't uh, entirely happen or go to plan in different areas. So plans would also be need to, well, they need to adapt and be ready to counter these things should uh, it not quite go to plan with the uh, training and I think that's a key point there. The, the, less, the, the key lesson seems to be co better cooperation between all the various elements. So the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the tanks, the infantry, better coordination between all those so that your plan um, is likely to, to go well. But also retaining that sense of improvisation 
if things don't go to plan. And that's, I think the rather recurring theme tonight is going to be, what do you train your men for? Do you train them for a very specific action and hope and assume it's going to that it's going to unfold in that way you've planned it, or do you give people a general uh, training to be able to deal with situations? And it, our conclusions are, and we'll get on to this. That there, there were only three specific three D Day actions that were specifically trained for, i.e., they were they worked on layouts of the exact environment they were going to take. In there. And that is for an invasion of 156,000 men over five landing beaches. You know, to think there's only three. Well, we, we will be proved to be, you know, if people want to correct us, that's fine. And we'll get to what those three sites are in a minute. So um, it will, we'll move on. So this, this is it. The two types of training we've identified are specific so you've got a specific objective in mind and you have to train exactly how to do that and then the general training for d-day and um within that there are various other kind of parameters we can discuss but we're going to go through the various things and talk about them so one of the things the allies did is they built some sections of atlantic wall in the uk to practice on and according to the kind of official website there are five such places so sheriff muir up in scotland hankley common in surrey castle martin over in wales sudbourne in suffolk and shubri ness although from my research it's actually actually in um uh i just said it early enough god it is now it's, it's another place another nest there not shubri ness it's near Shubiness, but it's it's on the coast there. And um, we've actually got footage from you folks from two of those sites there. Now, this is specifically for encountering these walls and how to deal with these walls. So these are not sites, we think, where infantry trained particularly. This is where they sent people with weaponry to see what would be needed to breach, hit, clear these walls. Um, so we're going to turn to um, Sheriff Muir. So thank you to Jim for providing us this is this is a site up in scotland not far from sterling castle and this is a section of wall they built so this is jim introducing a bit of wind there this is jim introducing what there is to be to be found there and then we'll be and ben will talk this is sheriff muir just a few miles outside sterling and it feels like it's 100 miles from the sheriff muir's been used as a training ground for centuries the name means that it's the moor used for the so that was just to give Jim a bit of a credit there, but this is his, uh, and this is what the kind of thing they're practicing on there. This is a Churchill tank using for scenes to clear a wall. And then while, while this is Jim's footage and I'm gonna play that and then me and Ben will talk about it. So who was using these sorts of sites, Ben? So you'd have the engineers here first that would be building these concrete uh, positions, trying to replicate uh, bits of the Atlantic wall that they know that the armoured units uh, would, would be coming up against when they began to touch down and move off those, uh, those beaches. So first of all, the engineers building these sites and complexes once they're built uh, from the uh, the diaries and accounts that I have, you'd find the engineers themselves would practice on blowing these positions up and then rebuild them again and blow them again. But then you have the Averys that would uh, be uh, tested against these positions as well. And it kind of links back into Dieppe uh, with the tanks that made it off the beaches at Dieppe that were patrolling up and down the promenades. Uh, mobile pillboxes effectively the churchills became anti-tank wall positions blocking ways off the beach they they didn't have the resources to knock out those anti-tank walls to get clear of the promenade itself so the lessons learned again in developing that weaponry the armored vehicles to breach these strong points and positions that we can see here and it seems uh, from the research that we've done not many people had access to this particular site at Sheriff Muir. It was more about sending the weaponry there, although there was a tragic incident where a local person was killed by in a live firing, and they had to, the local council had to request that the Ministry of Defence uh, 
they had a two hour break in the afternoons when it was a school run because they were worried about locals driving on the road near it being hit by live firing. But as, as Ben said, this is where they were practicing with things like the Churchill tanks and also weaponry. And we assume that they built the best kind of the engineers, Royal Engineers would have built these walls. And the theory was if it would penetrate this wall, it would penetrate theoretically the same equivalent wall in, in Normandy. What's interesting when Ben and me were having our chat about this yesterday is, of course, concrete isn't concrete. There's there's different types of concrete depending on how you've made it, what material you're using, um, what's the sand like, what's the cement, sand, uh, rock mix. Are you putting rocks in it? Are you putting shells in it? Are you putting this in it? So an eight foot section of wall is not the same in Dieppe as it would be in Calais or Normandy. We talk in Normandy all the time about the early bits of wall being a bit stronger than the later bits of wall because the construction force was better, the materials were better. But in principle, if uh, a vehicle can, or a wep weaponry can pierce an eight-foot wall in Scotland, it can pierce an eight-foot wall in, in Normandy. That's the idea, we think. And, and Jim pointed out when he filmed this is that some of the bullet impacts must be post-war because they continue to use this site after the war. So we're not necessarily looking at stuff that was happening in March and April and May 44, but it does show the lengths that were gone to, to, to practice for it. And also that this area was quite near the public. So they, they obviously weren't particularly worried about security. I mean, a wall is a wall is a wall, I, I suppose. But, and they also, according to some legends, they shipped in tons and tons of beach sand to put in front of the wall um, but there's no proof whether that deal didn't happen, but there was certainly an anti-tank ditch. You can see the bullet dings on the rebar there. It's really quite cool. You see on the footage there, folks? Um, so they obviously whacked a lot of stuff at this. So that is one of the Atlantic Wall training sites used primarily by engineers and armoured units, we think. Um, and so, again, thanks to Jim for that footage there. Um, the next site we have footage from is in Hankley Common, which is in Surrey. And I thank Nick for this footage. And this is a long set of film here. And we'll, do, we'll, we'll play that while we're talking. So um, this, this is in a, still an area, an area that the MOD still use there. And they still use this area for training today. But again, the, the, the most famous thing about the one at Hankley Common is there's a breach. There's a breach in the wall where clearly they blew it up with something. And again, this is all for practicing. Now, we, we know British troops use this. And Canadian troops, I believe, use Hankley Common as well, didn't they, Ben? Yeah, the Canadian engineers uh, built the wall uh, here itself. And again, that, that was the lessons learned from Dieppe, again, that uh, the Canadian engineers come here, build this wall, uh, and begin to start the, the training, intensifying into uh, 43 especially, and then petering off towards 44 as the uh, exercises begin to take more shape out on the coastal areas with, with landings. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, I cannot thank these people enough, Jim and Nick, for going out and getting this footage. And that's one of the wonderful things we can do on this on this channel now is take you to these places, you know, in your living rooms there. And, you know, I'm here in Normandy. I can get footage of Normandy, but I can't get footage of this. And um, it was obviously constructed very well. And a number of people went through this facility. But again, this is not where the majority of infantry went through that. We're going to come up with later on. But um Scott Grimwood is saying, by the way, that there are records in the States of training in the Shafe records. And he says there's something in G3, um, whether that will have particular details of exactly the training programs they're doing. It'd be interesting to find out. I think, obviously, the majority of people who are writing books about units are writing about the combat period. That's what they want to write about, whether it's in North Africa or Italy and normally. And the training, obviously, every book it tends to have that chapter about the formation of a unit, the training of the unit, but it seems that they don't seem to go into much. Deal. There's the breach. There's the breach in the wall. And there's a plaque there now, which I think Nick freezes on in a second so we can see that there. But that is, yeah, people can walk their dogs there. You can go there and have a look at that. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, it shows the preparation that was put in for something as monumental as Operation Overlord. So, again, thank you very much for these guys. It is really cool. So um, while it's still playing along there, Ben, anything else we want to add about this, the Atlantic Wall training? I think you, you can see visually why you wouldn't necessarily have uh, infantry units coming here, the commando units, rangers, because the weaponry that they would uh, would carry – 
Uh, if you take the infantry, if you were to fire a pit uh, bomb at this piece of concrete, you'd probably just make a small dent in it, really. So You're more likely to hurt yourself, aren't you? Really? <laughs> yeah. So there's there's not really much use in bringing your infantry to a solid wall like this. It it just shows it's more use for the engineers, where larger demolition would be required. They would practice the armoured vehicles, the Avries coming in to practice on these facilities, uh, as we can see. And, yeah, the density of that wall, good couple of metres thick. It's really uh, what are the infantry going to gain by firing rounds at the concrete wall? Because to go back to their training and their plan, hopefully these positions would have been nullified by the RAF or the US Air Force, followed up by the naval pre-bombardment. And these fixed positions hopefully would be taken quickly uh, with the infantry on the ground, either uh, uh, killing any German defenders in it, if there's any left, or taking prisoners and moving on. And the key with the training that you see uh, in lots of the documents is the word momentum, keeping that momentum going in uh, in the uh, movement. And that's key to the training as well. And I also think instil instilling confidence in the troops as well, because they're constantly, in terms of the Royal Engineers with their weapon, we look at the development in the 79th Armour Division of all the different vehicles, and it goes from Valentines to Shermans and, and you know, the, the different tanks and Mark One, Mark Two, Mark Three of these devices and explosives and things like that. But there's nothing better than showing men something actually physically blowing up in front of them to prove to them that the gadget they have is going to be effective because that's the sort of thing that you'd be inspired by you know the troop commanders can tell that as you know there'd be a turnover of men in the unit new men coming to the unit so the old sweat would say we 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 were down at practice range two months ago you should have seen the hole we made in that wall with these things it's going to do that job of making people feel confident about the the, the forthcoming invasion because don't forget some of these units Let's take the British 3rd Division, for example. They've been four years waiting for this. A lot of nerves, a lot of um, tension about getting back. And they may not know where they're going to be landing. Is it going to be France? Is it going to be Belgium? Is it going to be Norway? Whatever. But if you can show these men that the weapons they have, the systems they have, are going to destroy what the Germans have built, that confidence is, is going to be really, really important. And, of course, it's going to go back. And then the, the people inventing the gadgets can look at the, the results of this and say, OK, 10 pounds of explosives does that, 20 pounds does that, 40 pounds does that, so on. And they've got their data to work with, which is, is so important. So this is an important part of the preparation for the Royal Engineers and the armoured units for Normandy. But we have yet to come up about, about where the infantry go, which is, we're, we're going to. We'll just carry on letting this footage go because it's just so amazing having it. And uh, I didn't, I should have asked what the name of Nick's dog is there because we give <laughs> When we do shows from Normandy and Duncan is filming and Duncan's dog Bentley is on screen, this is now the second World War II TV dog. And this, there's some other bits and pieces there. This is obviously a section of, of, of reinforced steel. They, they've got ta the tank traps we're going to get to in a minute, the dragon's teeth that you, you actually don't see very often in Normandy, but you do see later on in Germany. Uh, so they obviously use this ground for a lot of different things that the armor and the engineers would like you to find. So concrete road obstacles and Atlantic war with We'll get, I might try and skip till we can get to the, uh, the dragon's teeth bit. Cause I think that's pretty cool. There really are the dragon's teeth. So yeah, there are none of them in Normandy, are there, but there are certainly them in Germany. So we obviously built them. And this also connects, I'm assuming with our show yesterday about aerial reconnaissance, because we would have had to have found out what these things are. For us to be able to make a replica of the Atlantic Wall, we're going to have to have photos of what the Germans are building. We're going to have to have information given to us by the SOE, by the resistance of measurements. So to build a replica Dragon's te Teeth um, installation, you've got to find the information what the real ones were like. So I'm assuming some brave Belgian or whatever got the information about the dimension of these things, and therefore this is information we could use. So... All fantastic stuff there. Each part of this training uh, for each unit uh, is just one small piece of, of the cog. Pepper, the dog is called Pepper. Breaking news, everybody. The dog is called Pepper. She is called Pepper. So they are a star in the making. Sorry to interrupt you, Ben. So, yeah, each small bit of this training for individual units builds into that 
bigger cog. Uh, and to, to think again, the engineers blowing the walls here or the Avery's coming in and practicing, although the infantry aren't there, they'd be elsewhere doing their training. It would all hopefully come together and fit together, ready for the actual uh, overlord part of the operation itself. So it, it's key and it's essential that they do practice and train on these. They don't collectively all need to be in the same place. It's dispersed all around the country in different locations. Uh, and then it all kind of comes together for the exercise Fabius, uh, the main landings in May 44 practice runs, uh, where they are then combined with the RAF Navy and the Army uh, as their final rehearsal. Yeah, and um, a good time to just talk about as well the secrecy element, because that's another aspect we need to consider is the more people you put through a training site that is including what we know about German positions, the more chance you are ha of, of information leaking. We do not want the Germans to find out where we're going. And if there's a particular type of defense that we know only exists in France and doesn't exist in Norway, for example, and that information gets out there, there's a potential of the enemy finding out that our focus is on training for France. And that, of course, is a bad thing. So we have to consider, just like we did with aerial reconnaissance yesterday, the training of men is paramount, but keeping Operation Overlord a secret is probably even more important because you don't want to get to a landing site and find the Germans already there in greater numbers waiting for us. And all the training we've uh, given to our men becomes counts for nothing because they're all dead before they got the landing craft because the Germans have a tank division sitting there. So this is, it's a chess game of giving our troops knowledge, but keeping the whole overall plan secret. And I can only imagine what a headache it was for the, the allied planners to, to balance all that. Um, it is very complicated. So that I think, We've probably done enough as we need to do on that. So, again, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jim, for getting us that incredible footage there. Um, brilliant stuff. So we're going to move. This is a quote here from Ian Hamilton. Ian Hamilton was in 22nd Dragoons. Now, he actually did his training in Suffolk in the in, in the, the Sudmore area. Where, and my friend Alex Scott went to see what there is still existing at the Antique Wall there. Basically, not very much. It's either overgrown or been destroyed. But he says... He refers to there being a village that was um, sealed off and they were practicing on, on, on replicas of Antique Wall with pillboxes, bunkers, walls, minefields. And that area in Suffolk is close to Orford, which was also near the beach and also had some radar stuff going. And Orford is still another site that is still, I believe, used by the MOD. So Ian Hamilton. And Ian, one of Ian Hamilton's troop commanders, by the way, I've mentioned this on another World War II TV show, was Ian Carmichael, the, the guy who became an actor post-war, was in... Um, I'm all right, Jack, and Private's Progress. He kind of played those upper-class twits, but he was a 22nd Dragoons flail commander on D-Day on Juno Beach. So Ian Hamilton was with him, but Ian Carmichael was in that same unit. Um, Fritton Lake, this is where I'm going to shut up and hand over to Ben, because Ben has done, done a lot of work about this, although I do remember going to Fritton Lake. In, it's on the Suffolk-Norfolk border on a scout camp when I was about 12. So, um, and, and when I was told as a 12-year-old scout that I'd be going to a site that was also used in World War II, you can imagine how I, my eyes were wide, widened at that exciting there. But Ben is the one who has done the majority work on Fritton Lake. So, Ben, explain what Fritton Lake is all about. Yeah, so this lovely tranquil lake uh, in uh, a, a small forest area uh, is requisitioned uh, off the Summer Layton family uh, that still own the estate to, to this day. Uh, the engineers come in along with the 79th uh, Armoured and they realise that uh, in preparation for Overlord that there will be amphibious tank landings with the DD tanks, Duplex, Drive, Shermans. Uh, at the time, around 42 and in 43, uh, when this facility opens, they don't have those Sherman tanks available. So they begin to train using Valentine tanks, so DD Valentines, which we'll see a photo of later. The area that we're uh, looking at now was the hard standing tank apron. Uh, it is private property, but if you do get uh, permission to visit, you can see uh, grease pits marked by those stakes there. There's cables lying all around on the floors. 
uh, it's pretty much left as it was. And as we turn and look all the way down along what would have been a tank park here, uh, with covers on either side to hide the tanks away. At the very end, there was a, uh, the best way to describe it would be two pits that uh, would be filled with water. In the very bottom of the two pits, there was the hull of a Valentine tank and a Sherman tank. And this is where the uh, tank crews that would cycle through uh, the facility at Fritton Lake would uh, use the escape apparatus uh, and train ready for in case they were in a DD tank and it would uh, sink out at sea. Uh, the accounts of that, the crew would get into the hull of these tanks in the bottom of these pits. The engineers would open up the, uh, the taps that would allow late uh, water to flow in from the uh, from the lakes, the accounts, it was freezing cold water. It was pitch black. And the next thing you knew, this uh, this pit would fill up very quickly with the water. The tank crews would have to put in their mouthpiece, turn on their valve to a small uh, oxygen bottle on their front, and they would be expected to escape from the uh, hatches of the tanks and then get to the top and uh, get out safely. So that was uh, the preparation prior to going out onto the lake. Uh, also, the crews had to go through swimming training for those who couldn't swim especially. And that was at a Lido down at, uh, oh, my mind's gone blank where it is now. It's just sadly been uh, filled in and uh, removed. Um, but the pool was still there and uh, I've been along to visit where they'd uh, done the swimming training for the crews. What would happen with the uh, tanks themselves on that hard standing? There were two uh, or three ramps that led off into the lake. So the canvas screen would be inflated on the Valentine tanks. They would then position themselves on a ramp similar to the uh, uh, LCT ramps. Uh, they would line up. They uh, would engage their propellers ready to go and then move down into the lake. We can see the uh, Valentine there it would uh, swim across the lake to the very far side where they would drive up onto the, uh, the beach area at the uh, side of the lake. They'd lower the screen and then use the roads to go back round to the hard standing to do it again. Uh, as simple as that. Uh, but there were casualties here during the uh, the training, one in particular, a trooper Lloyd from the first East Riding Yeomanry. Uh, the accounts are that his DD Valentine was overloaded. Uh, rather than five, there was seven on it. And the extra weight uh, ended up with water coming over the top of the canvas screen that you can see. And the uh, Valentine begins to sink. The majority of the crew get away, but then they realise that Trooper Lloyd isn't there. One of the men dives down to try and get him, uh, and sadly, they could not get to him. He was trapped in the driver's compartment uh, and uh, drowned. The tank was recovered, uh, and Trooper Lloyd was then uh, obviously returned to his hometown close to Liverpool, I believe it is, where he's buried uh, today. So there were casualties in the training here in the tranquil piece of the uh, Norfolk countryside. And just as an aside, when I did the uh, Halloween show last October, um, we talked about the fact there is a ghost story there of a Sherman DD with the screens on it that goes across a road because there's a there's a kind of public road that kind of bisects through the camp now and yeah. and people have described you know have described going late at night seeing this tank cross the road and you know i'm just i'm just saying it's one of those things there there's some physical scars left at the site from world war ii but there's also a yeah. story that the locals tell and it's one of those ones if you go to a pub near there late at night and you mention that you're there for world war ii someone is bound to tell you about the ghost tank that goes yeah. there and whether you want to believe it or not believe it but it's just, it's just an interesting aside that this place has still has that legacy there and um and and i'm glad you mentioned ben the fact that there were casualties because that is something that we're going to be discussing later on in that you cannot train an invasion force 
for an operation like Overlord with live weapons, with machine guns, with explosions, with mines, and not have some people killed along the way. That is just one of those inevitable things. And we will talk about the, some of the some of the well known incidents and some of the data later on. So that's that's Fritz and Lake, which is an amazing amazing story. And and we should stress that's not the only training place for DDs. That was predominantly with the British one. There are Americans are doing stuff further west in the country. So we cannot in a single show tonight cover every area where training was done for D Day. We'd be here, you know, for the for the rest of the day. Although not much details about some of the specific training programs. But we'll continue. So. Just um, Just on that, Paul, I think it was classed as freshwater and saltwater training and Fritton obviously fresh. And then yeah. from here, the units would progress down to the open sea uh, and uh, train on that aspect as well. Yeah. So the next big place um, is, is up in Scotland, the number one combined training centre. And this is an extraordinary place because in our research for this, and you can find this online, something like, 250,000 British, Canadian, and other troops went through this training site. And Paul Reed, I think, mentioned this earlier in the in the uh, in the comments there. And that was a much more general site. It had a bit of everything up there. It had a, in kind of locks and rivers and sea and mountains and hills and rivers and creeks and rocks and sand and marsh and everything there. And that was used over the course of like three years of training. And so most British units, most Canadian units would have been through some kind of assault training up there in, Ver in Vereri. And um, yeah, including my great uncle with the Royal Oslo Rifles went through there. And this is the thing we were saying we couldn't find many accounts. You know, most of the books I've got and Ben's got about various units of the third division, fifth division, they kind of mention it, but it only it really gets mentioned in passing. My great uncle talks more about the fact there are attractive wrens there at the site than he does actually the training they're going for, although he does set lots of physical fitness, lots of running over kind of obstacle courses in the woods. And it seems, Ben, that the training here wasn't specifically for objectives on D-Day. It was training for d-day as a as a grand scheme is that is that i'm kind of right on that aren't i yeah the the accounts that i've i've come across one you you usually find it's the soldiers complaining that uh they were outside in bell tents in the winter the tents were covered in snow it was freezing cold we didn't have enough blankets uh, it wasn't enjoyable the uh, the training element to it, the accounts that uh, I've gone through and, uh, and read through today, it's, uh, uh, again, complaints of we were getting our feet wet. We were in the locks and it was getting used to uh, embarking and disembarking from the landing craft. Again, you might think it's a simple thing, but when it comes to uh, the actual day, they need to make sure this is a slick operation, uh, especially in some of the larger craft, uh, like the landing craft infantry, where you could have up to uh, nearly 200 potentially on that coming ashore. Uh, it needs to be done swiftly. And this is their opportunity in this training. And it might seem boring thinking that we've got to go up the, the gangplank, uh, get on board. We need to know where we're going to be once inside. We'll go out to sea, sail around, and then come back in and disembark. But this, it's repetitive training to make sure it's ingrained in each of the soldiers' minds that this is what will happen, this is what we'll do. Uh, and again, in Scotland, with the smaller landing crafts on the locks, uh, that was the same, uh, pulling up, onto these uh, shorelines, disembarking, fixed positions that may have been marked out uh, and uh, assaulting them. But it's more about getting this repetitive training going. Yeah, it's for training for the procedures, not training for the specifics. That's, I think, the, the, the point we want to make is it's, it's you know, my great uncle in the Royal Oster Rifles, we mentioned, you know, running out of landing craft and then just taking up a position on the hill, then going back round, getting on the landing craft again, going out, climbing that, and then going, doing the same thing again and just running out and, and, and streamlining and smoothing down that procedure there. So the Navy and the Army and the, the, the various liaison troops are all able to do their part of that operation 
precisely but it's not like although they have kind of generic bits of maybe anti-tank ditches and anti-tank walls and things like that they're not training it's not like they're building an exact replica of Corsair or an exact replica of of um you know uh Anel on gold beach because that's not what they're trying to do here they're trying to build up this this generic training that will be able to be implemented at a later date because if you think about it, we, we're showing you dates from the first training that was being done there in 1941 i mean they don't even 42 they don't even know where they're going to be invading yet they don't even know there is going to be an invasion so it's about um building up this army navy cooperation and in scotland i guess because it's a, that much further away from the luftwaffe taking photos it's that much a further away from the civilian population and it's just lot it's got all the conditions they need in terms of you know, the, the crags and the moors and the hills and the mountains the locks and everything and yeah so that's why they seem to choose it we think um if anyone's got any really good data about training if anyone's granddad happened to be a training officer there and has got some details of the training that was done there we'd love to see it because uh so we've not turned up a huge amount there um and indeed someone's saying it's not just training for, for overlord there they're training for some of the earlier operations yeah they're just, you know even training theoretically for dieppe and torch and was also done there it's just amphibious training uh, uh, combined operations training in general but it is where the men for d-day would have done a lot of their um their stuff so um we're going to move on a bit um, to this is a, 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 one of the references I did find in um, Assault Division by Norman Scarf about the 3rd Division. He just mentions there in the book that the, the Suffolks found the training there not particularly popular, but the East Yorks all entered into it with the zest and high spirits it demanded. But that's it. That that one paragraph is really all there is in a divisional a book about a divisional history about the training there. It's just saying they went up to combined training center in Verary in the spring of summer in 1942, uh, and and how the the generals are overseeing this. That's it. That's that is the reference to the training up there. So yeah, they say not very much in the way of specifics. Um, the Americans were doing some training at a very famous place in Woolacom Bay and Bronton Burrows. Now, I want to say, folks, we're not going to go into too much detail about this today because I want to do a special from there at some point in the future. Thanks to Ryan Gearing, who is another World War II TV supporter. He's made contact with the association down there. We're going to try and arrange for Ben or someone to go down there and do some filming, access their archives, and have us take around the site um, where uh, they had bunkers and pillboxes and famously there are concrete landing craft there now in our research for this and again we can prove to be wrong on this only 14,000 american troops went through Woolacom park um which compares very it's very interesting to compare that with the 250,000 who went through scotland so this was important um and and ben i want you to talk a bit about um the operation that took place there fabius so um if i'll hand over to you to talk about that yeah you uh if you've ever visited here the landscape is uh, very uh, similar to omaha beach uh, so you the well the topography the way that uh, you've got a nice golden open sand beach that then leads up to a bluffs and, and the rise so you can understand why the americans uh, did come here to uh, train and select it again for the landing craft side of things being able to come in on a wide open beach uh, it's it makes sense why the americans chose here to uh, to do that uh, you make reference to not as many of the british uh, training uh, uh, not as many of the americans train here as the british canadians up uh, in scotland uh, I'm not sure on the, the reason why it wasn't utilised uh, as much, uh, but there's not an awful lot there to see today if you do go. There is a memorial that overlooks the beach that makes reference to it. Um, the, there's not an awful lot really that uh, you, you can say about Woolacoon. The training for the Americans would be similar to the British Canadians in that on the uh, the beach itself, they would put, uh, as you saw there, barbed wire. They'd put minefields down, pretend minefields uh, marked out. 
uh, fixed positions for the infantry to come ashore and uh, assault before, before moving on. But it's not to the extent of Exercise Fabius where they're moving further and further inland uh, to objectives. This is pretty much on that main beachfront uh, where they would come ashore and practice. Uh, with that, live fire was used at these locations. And later on, to go back to Fabius again, you'll see the combined arms where the Navy are firing live uh, ammunition shells into these positions. You'd have the uh, rockets coming in. Uh, you'd have the DDs landing alongside the infantry as well. So the combined arms as aspect in that May, Fabius is really ramping up for the training, where, again, you could probably say similar to the British Canadians in Scotland here at Woolacoon, you've got that repetitiveness of training, embarking, disembarking. It's easy to get in and out uh, with those uh, LCAs you can see behind uh, and getting those basic drills in place ready for the invasion. Yeah. I mean, I want to be clear again, They, although the Bay is reminiscent of Omaha. They've not tried in any way to replicate the exact defences of Omaha, Omaha in terms of there being particular beach exits and bunkers of the type they knew were being built in normally. It's generic train. So what they're doing is they're, here's a here's a bunker of the type you'll find in Normandy. Here's the practice with the bazooka. Here's the practice with the explosives and the satchel charges. But they've not tried to set up a precise layout of Omaha Beach, um, at least not that we have, have found. Um, and, and by the way, this is also a good point to mention the 82nd and 101st seem to have done no specific training for anything they were likely to find in Normandy, like Lafayette Bridge or Causeways or Holdy Gun Battery or, or um, the Gun Battery at um, Saint Martin de Varaville. There seems to be no reference in the training to working on like a marked out version in fields where they had things marked out with like you know, bits of mine tape or something. All their training was as you would expect, attacks on fixed positions, how to seize a, a bridge from both sides, how to take a, a, a defensive trench system, how to take on a small town, whatever it would be. No, Very few people are getting a specific, specific training, which brings us to our next subject, which is, I know is close to your heart, Ben, is that's the training for the assault on the Orne bridges, the now known, known Pegasus and Horsa bridges in Benouville uh, between Caen and Saw Beach. So here, folks, is a photo post Normandy of the landing site. There are the three gliders there, one, two, and three by we now call Pegasus Bridge, and then Horsa Bridge over there. The, so you got the, the canal and the river there. That's where we now know Major Howard and the Oxen Bucks landed, and Jim Wallwork, the, the lead co uh, glider pilot, brought them in there. We all know that. But Ben, this is one of the operations, one of the three we've identified where they did specifically train on a, a, a site that replicated where they were going in Normandy. So tell us where it was, Ben. So initially, Major Howard is just training at Bridges. Uh, and the closer it gets to, uh, to June, uh, they're ramping up their training. He uh, gets a visit from uh, Pine Coffin, who tells him that I've just located... Uh, two bridges just north of Exeter uh, that may be uh, of uh, use to you and your training. Uh, pretty much straight away, uh, Major Howard uh, gets across there and inspects these two bridges that we can uh, can see here. And you can see how it's uh, it's pretty similar to, uh, uh, to uh, the Carn Canal River or the layout of those two bridges. So he gets there, he inspects it, and he immediately then calls for the uh, platoons to be moved up to this area so they can then begin uh, their training on these positions. That, what was that training like for Major Howard and his men? Uh, what they would do, because they would be going into battle in the horse or gliders, so they wouldn't train uh, with bringing the horse or gliders in here, what they would do, they would bring the men in on trucks and they were made to lie down on their stomachs in positions, trying to replicate where they would potentially land uh, for D-Day itself. And then this was all observed by umpires who would uh, be overseeing it all. 
individually the the platoon six platoons in total would be sent off to then go and do their set tasks uh, major howard had uh, by then realized he got sight of uh, the aerial reconnaissance photos he knew exactly where he was going uh, i think it's roughly three weeks before the operation he can finally fully brief his platoon commanders who then in turn can uh, a week or so later give more information to the uh, the other ranks on what's going to take place but they uh, they trained uh, the six platoons all trained to do each other's tasks so major howard knew that if he had his full complement of men there it was great if only one glider landed at one bridge he knew that from this training that that platoon knew the drills and the tasks of the other two platoons and would carry uh, out those. So that's the extent the training's going into. They would actually uh, fight uh, opposition at these bridges as well. And there's quite a, a funny account of uh, uh, they turn up uh, to the, uh, the area of where they're training. The men of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry get into covering ditches and hedges around the uh, the area of where they're going to do this mock assault on the bridges. Uh, while they're waiting for the umpires to give the signal to go, uh, Polish soldiers are patrolling. That is their enemy for the night. Uh, and the Poles, before the exercise starts, find Major Howard and his men all in the uh, ditches and tree line and go rushing back to their command post to send out the signal that uh, uh, they're under attack. But sadly, uh, <laughs> it hadn't started. The umpires with a language barrier couldn't kind of tell them, no, ignore them being there, it's not started. So it uh, uh, mayhem kind of ensues with the ox and bucks and the poles remonstrating with each other that you haven't killed me, the exercise hasn't started, but yes, I have killed you, the umpire's not knowing what to do. Uh, and in the end, they, they just let this unfold and, and carry on. So it was a bit of a mess for the training. But again, probably a little bit of reality of the unknown of what could actually happen. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was a funny account from uh, some of the men of the, uh, the Ox and Bucks. And then to take that to what actually did happen uh, on the night of the 5th into the 6th on... Uh, Horser Bridge, uh, two of the lieutenants, I think it's uh, Fox, uh, gets to the bridge second. Uh, he should have been first, but he gets there second and he he trots up to, uh, I think it's Lieutenant Smith that's on there. Uh, and he says he's looking around because there's complete silence at Horser Bridge. Nothing is going on. And he's looking around for the umpires, thinking this is a training exercise. We're meant to have some enemy here to shoot at. And it was all over within seconds, really, for them. But that shows that they were prepared. Their training uh, was thorough, especially under Major Howard. And they were fully prepared for their dedicated, get, uh, dedicated tasks at Pegasus and Horser Bridge. And this, and this is completely... Um the reason why this training was at a specific site because so much hinges on the successful capture of those bridges. It, you can argue the entire airborne bridgehead of the 6th Airborne Division uh, across on Breville is dependent on this. The Sword Beach landing, the approach on Caen, everything is hinging on that one event. So in this case, they have gone to the trouble of replicating an exact attack albeit, as you say, not with the gliders now, although that would be a separate one because Jim Wolwick and the pilots had trained on Twin Rivers elsewhere, and they? So they, they had done some pretty specific training as well. Um, so that's because this site is so important. And the second one, which I'll let you talk about, is Merville Battery. So Colonel Otway and the 9th Battalion, who have to seize Merville Battery, which we now know, folks, ended up being different caliber guns that we thought of. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. We'll do a Merville show, show, uh, show at some point in the future. And if you want to know more about Merville Battery, Neil Barber's excellent book about the 9th Parachute Battalion is your start and end point, frankly, to learn about Merville Battery. But yeah. key battery, overlooking saw beat. So, Ben, they, Otway did train the men on a replica. So tell us about that. Yeah. Well, we have no photos of it, by the way, folks. <laughs> Just ben, ben talking. Just to link in with yesterday's talk again, 
uh, Ofway was able to do that because he has this aerial reconnaissance, the detail yeah. that it's able to bring back. They know the size of the uh, the casemates that are there. They can then mark them out. Uh, I'm sure it's Incapen or, or Inkpen where it's uh, uh, down. Uh, in, the, in the countryside, again, well out the way of prying eyes, close to where the 9th Battalion uh, uh, billeted. Uh, he sets these four casemates uh, out uh, and they practice day after day, similar to Major Howard. Uh, they practice with a full complement. They practice with lesser numbers. They all know what to do if... Uh, one of the assault teams for casemate one isn't there. What is going to happen then? It's all uh, practiced endlessly uh, with it all marked out on the uh, this ground. Again, umpires would have been there to oversee that. There would have been a uh, uh, an enemy there for the uh, the men to uh, encounter as part to try and make it as real as you you could. Uh, the three gliders that should have landed at the battery. I don't think I've ever read any account of them training and coming into that exact site for a practice, but no. the private pilots would have been training elsewhere, ready for that. And in reality, the task they were given uh, was uh, really... Optimistic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very optimistic, to say the least, if you ever visit Merville Battery and stand, uh, stand in the middle of it thinking three horses should have come here. But... Uh, uh, yeah, Otway is relentless and very strict with his training. Uh, the men, there's accounts that they don't particularly like Otway as a person, but there is a hell of a lot of respect for him uh, as their officer, and they fully trust in him and uh, what he's uh, training them for. Similar to Howard, Otway's given early eyes on to his objective. He knows where he's going. He's able to sit there. He's given sole access into this room where he puts all his maps, his photos all around the room. Uh, a few weeks before, he can brief his officers, who then in turn will relay that. Uh, so, again, the secrecy side to it. Otway is probably desperate to tell his, uh, his officers what is exactly is going to happen, but he, he can't. He needs to retain that mm. information. But these markings in the field on the ground is giving them a chance or an idea of what they're going to be encountering, what equipment, what kit they're going to be taking in with them uh, is quite important as well. And then no doubt training, well, what happens if the peats don't turn up, uh, et cetera. And for Otway himself, that training probably does pay off on the night of the 6th of uh, yeah. June with what unfolded for him and the uh, the ninth battalion but what is interesting and thank you for that ben is that as we we of course know that merville is not the only gun battery that overlooks the landing beaches there's um daimler and him hillman and montfleury and and long Sommer and point du Hoc and crisbeck and all the others as well but we don't think and we, again, we, we we accept to be proved wrong that there is any specific training in advance of the landing for any of those sites. So although the the 4th Division landing on Utah would eventually get to Crisbeck, and we're going to be doing a show about the Asvel and Crisbeck batteries in June with Matt Broggy, who's a tour guide for Stephen Ambrose, he's going to talk about that. But that would have been uh, improvised, the, the plan put together once they were already in Normandy. There were, we don't think there was any preparation by the 4th Division for attacking Grisbeck. Neither do we think there was anything within the 50th Division, the Green Howards for Montfleury. Neither do we think there was anything. The Suffolks knew that they were going to be uh, facing Hillman, but we don't think there was any specific training in advance of D-Day on any laid out configuration of what they were expecting to find at Hillman or Morris. That's at least in our research. The other, So we said there's going to be three, three specific bits of training. The two we've done, Pegasus and Merville. The third is the Rangers, second battalion US Rangers at Point du Hoc. Although they only seem to have trained for the cliff climb I have yacht, I went for all my small, small unit action reports, went for my reigning Ranger training paperwork from the, to the best of my knowledge, they did not train for an attack on the configuration of the guns as they expect to fight. They did not train on a triangular shaped, you know, marked out battlefield with six casemates and trenches based on what what 
we now know was at Pointe du Hoc. They had trained to assault positions. They, I'm not saying they hadn't been trained for what they had to do, but I have not found any reference to a specific training to deal with the Pointe du Hoc site beyond the actual getting up the cliffs bit. And even that, they trained on low cliffs, high cliffs, granite cliffs, chalk cliffs, shallow cliffs, steep cliffs, wet weather, cold weather, dark night, just to get them good at climbing. But it wasn't a specific um, training. But if anyone who's watching this has got something about the American 4th Division or the 29th or the 30th or the 9th or the British 49th or 50th, and they have got someone that can say, you know what? This battalion did a training in May about a thing. We'd love to hear from you because, you know, we're not saying we've got everything. But it does say there's there's some interesting um, discrepancies in that those three sites did have a specific plan for them, but the others, the training is more general. Which brings us to our next thing is about the, the training just genuinely intensifying. this. And Scott Grimwood mentioned earlier about the training to get off. I'm going to show something for Scott because he's ahead of the game. Um the the training on and i'll show you this later on but there's the bit somewhere i've got here of them using a, cli a climbing wall where is it hang on i'll try and find it there we are this is a lot of american troops a lot of commonwealth troops did this training which was to practice getting off types of ships so nsts lcts whatever it would be getting off so up and down nets but not specifically for a particular ship so lots of people went through this kind of training so scott there we are most people who came to Normandy were done that. And Ben, you made a very good point that most men involved in the assault had been to taught how to swim, um, but not all. But that's an interesting thing. That, so that's a, that's a standard bit of D-Day training that it seems everyone went through is climbing down cargo nets. Well, not the airborne, I'm guessing. Well, we're going back to what Ben's worked out. So Ben, this tell us, tell us what we're looking at uh, here with this bit of documentation. So we've got the uh, diary here. I'm sure it's from number three commando or possibly four. Uh, but we can see here January, February, their training uh, routine. Uh, and it gives you an idea of what would be, be going on for them. Lots of visits to the firing range, uh, drills with, with weapons. Uh, fitness is, is key. Uh, you can see their speed marches, night exercises, map reading, uh, drills, walks. Uh, and it's the closer you get to uh, June itself, you can see the training intensifies there. You've got football uh, at one point as well. So a bit of recreation and rest for the men in there. But then the uh, the training intensifies is at April, uh, May. Okay. So, May, you're looking around the time of exercise Fabius now, so it's pretty much uh, they they realise that it's getting close. The officers obviously know that. They're doing weapons drills still, lots of fitness. It carries on. Uh, mind detecting, uh, and you'll see that with some of the photos that we've got a bit later on uh, of other units practising using the equipment. Again, it's just relentless, really. Uh, it's intense training, repetitive, getting those drills, the basic drills ingrained into those men ready for uh, the operation. I'm just trying to think of uh, anything else on there that uh, stands out. Yes, 5th of May, uh, street fighting, uh, attack and defence. Uh, and that's uh, that was key. In the commando's war diaries, it actually gave diagrams and detail on how they would uh, practice this. Uh, and in the east end of London, the bombed out houses, they were used uh, for a short period of time by the commandos themselves. They'd cycle each unit through where they were able to practice their drills, procedures for house clearing. And I, I think it was two teams of uh, eight men for each side with uh, covering fire, uh, with light machine guns, no doubt Bren guns that would have line of sight along the roads. And then these two teams of eight would systematically enter these houses, giving covering fire to each side as they went in and did their house clearing uh, drills. There's a good set of photographs of the commandos at this uh, location uh, taken in May 44. Uh, and uh, in some of Neil Barber's books, Fighting with the Commandos, I think one of them, uh, there's photos in there 
of these units cycling through. But it's giving the commandos an opportunity to do this house clearing. But with the infantry, I haven't seen anything in this kind of detail for them themselves. And again, I, I just wonder whether it was exclusive for those specialist units, similar to the airborne doing their things, the commandos uh, carrying out this. And again, the key word in the document was the momentum and the rapidness of these house clearances was key. Yeah. I mean, it came up in your Tona show and Paul Reed was watching that and maybe Paul could jump in here. We know some allied units at various points, infantries were trained for what we would call now Fibua, fighting in, in built up areas. But it seems that lots of units didn't. My great uncle, I went through his notes, there's no reference to doing any particular house to house kind of fighting really. I mean, they would have done some kind of attacking on fixed positions, but it wasn't something they seemed to concentrate on. But Paul did seem to say that from when we got to Ortona, some of the British units there had done urban warfare. The commandos, what's interesting, of course, is they have a legacy of, of urban warfare because of San Nazaire, for example. So, you know, going back to his, uh, okay, this is not the same commander units, but there has been this, even going back to Lofoten Islands in Norway earlier, the, Nor the commandos have done this thing where timing is imperative. You're not relying necessarily on, on support from other people because the commandos don't necessarily have tank support or air support or naval support. So I can understand where within the commando mentality, there's this idea of making sure you can get in somewhere quickly, clear it and get out quickly. Um, but it, it, as you say, Ben, it doesn't seem to have transferred universally to the British and Canadian armies. But again, if people have, have got precise data about certain rid, uh, units, um, we love to hear from it. Paul is saying, yeah, it was not uncommon, but that, yeah, again, this is the thing. What What's not uncommon? What's common? It, you know, I've, we've been through, I mean, I thank you very much for your information, Paul, but it, it seems to be something that if units had it available to them, they would do it. But it doesn't, from my interpretation, seem to be something that has been insisted on universally at a higher level. Would you agree with that, Ben? Yeah, it when I was looking through it, I've just seen it is number three commando. So when, when I was thinking or what I was thinking looking through this is when it makes reference to the rapidness, the, the momentum, the end game for, uh, for three commando is the village of Amphreville. Uh, and it makes me think that was this training specifically for when they got to the village of Amphreville, they need to clear those houses because that, is then it needs to be consolidated. That is effectively the front line then. So they need to make sure the whole village is clear of the enemy. And maybe that linked in with with the reasons for this, because up to yeah. that point, they were moving from the beach inland very quickly uh, to get to link it up with the airborne, uh, sixth airborne, uh, and then pushing up to Amphreville. Does this training tie in with that and link in with, with that? aspect for them yeah but 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 we, we want to be clear again they're not training on specific layouts of buildings or at least yeah. we don't think they are it's not like you know you, when you think of saw beach and juno beach there are distinctly urban areas in, in land from those beaches we would have had the aerial photos we would have had the maps if the british army had wanted to construct a replica of wiesterham they could have done uh, I'm assuming they just obviously decide it was that they didn't need to. What you do is you train men for the principles of house clearing, the principles of getting off beaches, the principles of attacking fixed positions, and then allow your company and platoon commanders to actually do that on the day, depending on where you land. Because when we were having our pre-chat yesterday, Ben and I, we were saying, what if, what if you've trained for a very precise location and you end up with the tide landing and the current landing a mile away? It then means you've got to overcome something you've yeah. trained for. So it seems the key with the majority of troops for Normandy is to give them the oh, to give them an overview of a training that they can adapt at the site they actually find themselves at on D-Day. So lots of, as we said, generic training taking bridges, taking positions, taking woods. And this is the, you know, the training manuals would have platoon attacks, company attacks, um, flanking maneuvers, all those you know standard things that is is there. But as I say, as Paul says, more research. Than that. Again, when we put this program together, we thought we'd better find a lot more stuff than we did. And we realized there's a big gap. Uh, I, I, there must be something somewhere, but we just haven't found it very much. So, um, yeah, and Paul is making the point that it would be the units that happen to be near Blitz, Blitz cities. 
But even that bit in East End, that doesn't seem to have been used for very long, does it, Ben? It was like a couple of months. Yeah, it was a short period of time before they, they moved on. And ju just to go back to what you said uh, on the training for the these fixed positions, I think it would come back to that the Allies were confident in their plan that they wouldn't need to make these replicas of set locations, for example, like Strong Point Cod on Sword Beach. Uh, they were confident that the pre-bombardment from the air and naval part naval naval, yeah. would destroy and suppress them, that the infantry would mop, mop up effectively and then move on. So they're not hanging around in that one area, hopefully for a long time, it's short and move on. So they're, they're encountering different situations all the time. But all, although they're different situations, they are fixed positions. So the training would be on focusing on assaulting the fixed yeah. positions. And, and Paul's making a point about the models and sand tables. And I suppose this is when we move from the word training to briefing i suppose really is because that's another phase isn't it you know you're you because the briefing phase you, when when we're not talking folks about the marshalling camps the sausage camps that's another subject for the day where the men all got sealed up in those last few weeks for d-day that's when the briefing begins but at that point the training has sort of ceased what you're doing now is you're doing your physical fitness in the morning you're you're, you're sharpening knives you're practicing cleaning your rifles but you've you've stopped doing the running about on exercise bit then so there's a distinct changeover from training to briefing so absolutely the the, the sand tables and the models would have been used for the briefing but not so much at the training stage um, is I think the distinction we're making, isn't it? Um, and Chris is mentioning uh, Tynan Village down in um, in Dorset, which yeah, which Jack Beckett and War History Online were talking about a few weeks ago, which is interesting. But again, in my research for there, it doesn't seem many people went through there. It, it seems it seems a few battalions, not a unit, it's not like um, the combined ops place up in Scotland that two hundred fifty thousand went through. It was a, a limited use, and I think possibly even by Home Guard as well were using it, but. Yeah, it's it, there's lots of rabbit holes again where you go down. Um, but um, we've got some photos just of, of, of that generic. This is what we mean. This is the running out of landing craft going into position on a beach. This is the stuff that these guys have been doing to the point where they're bored with it all through early 44. Um, and I, I, I forget. I think this might be 2nd Battalion Royal Oster Rifles again. Or it might be Canadian. This one, the first one was Royal Oster Rifles. I can't remember now. Um, this is a bit of footage. I'll, I'll just play this. Well, this is this is um, Americans going about training, and this is this is from that standard standard public domain footage. And this is all you know, South Coast um, in the uh, in in the um, uh, area around um, Woolacombe Bay. We we believe, although some of it we think is Scotland. We'll we'll play this and we'll talk about it. And if you want to make any comments, Ben, jump in. But this is see see. There's a marshal there, an umpire there. He's monitoring how fast these guys are getting out of the landing craft and then we think this is scotland yes yeah now my great uncle talks about there being instructors up there with what he called davy crockett hats now whether that was that guy there i don't know that's a, what the hell that hat is i don't is that a southwestern one of those i don't know but um th this is some of the training but this isn't again this is not training look at what happens when they get off the landing craft they're just going into position of sand they're not moved they're not taking on a, a exact layout of a configuration it's just the it's the cooperation between the navy and the infantry it's clear is it's what you have to practice and hone yeah in uh portsmouth area hailing island you had hms north one two three and four who uh, uh were uh, basically doing what we just saw with the flat bottom landing craft they go out daily and practice beaching uh, unbeaching themselves, getting back out to sea. Uh, and so you've got the Navy doing their own training in uh, specific areas uh, ready. And then that training then links in when it comes to exercise Fabius, when they start having uh, the infantry, the armour boarding onto, embarking onto the uh, craft. Uh, so it's all linking in together, although they're uh, separate it's this small uh, cogs all fitting together for the uh, for the uh, bigger picture. And HMS Northney was just one place where they were uh, training 
with the uh, flat bottom crafts in that area. Yeah. And we had the question come in, which I knew it was going to come in about, are we going to talk about exercise tiger? Um, and, and only really in passing, because that is a subject for a show. And I had been wanting to do a show on exercise tiger at some point, And I will do one uh, uh, and that for those who don't know, this was the exercise in April in Slapton Sands in the Southern England that, that, that went ghastly wrong because the German, um, Navy got involved, got sort of got wind of it and got amongst the LCTs, and it was a tragic day. Now, was it nine now 947, I think, or 46? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's over 900 with uh, a fair number of them buried in the Cambridge Cemetery in the UK still. Yeah, and, and Scott McGrim was making the point that the, the, the Coast Guard is the Coast Guard and the US Navy and the US Army involved in the uh, the uh, the landing craft ship fleet procedure yeah we mustn't forget the um uh the um that the coast guard element um another question is coming up and it's an, another potential rabbit hole um is it true that nobody prepared for the fighting through the bocage terrain and you go well um there's a lot to un unpack with that question there firstly um, the Allies were completely aware there was bocage in Normandy. You can see the preparation studies that people like Eisenhower had access to, where we've identified the field network system, we've looked at the height of the, the bocage, we've looked at the, the small fields, and that has all been identified. What is a little bit more mysterious is exactly how far the chain of command that information filtered. And if you meet most GIs who are part of a division like the 29th or the 30th, they say, even their officers say, you can watch my World War II TV hedgerows video for more information about that, that they were unprepared for what they were expecting to, to find in Normandy. But this is because you cannot brief one million men about exactly the terrain they're going to face in where they're landing because you're potentially giving the game away that we're going to Normandy because Normandy is the only place where there is that kind of bocage. So tell everybody what you're going to find there. You're, as we said earlier, you're potentially giving the, you're, you're letting the rabbit, you know, the cat out of the bag. You, everyone's going to find out it's, it's Normandy. So um, some troops had, again, rather like Paul Reed mentioning that the units billeted near blitz cities could do urban warfare in blitz cities. If you happen to be training in an area that had hedgerows like Devon or Dorset, they would train in them. But the question is, Ben, were they training in them specifically because it was hedgerows or were they training there because that's where they happen to be based? What's your take on that? Uh, there's definitely from the war diaries that I've looked at in the build-up, there's no specific details on, on hedgerow training. Um, I, I think it was just adapting the plans to what unfolded when they did get there. And you can see that in war diaries, uh, not just for infantry, even with the armoured units having to learn to fight in different ways in the terrain. It wasn't exactly what they expected. And it's there to, to see that these adaptations are happening out in the field as it um, unravels really um uh, the, there's different ways that they got around that we know that on the front of sherman's they put the uh, the teeth to dig into the bocage uh it, it's adapting while they're out there but as for training directly to deal with the bocage i've not seen any reference to that and, 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 and again, we, we, it's that whole thing about the secrecy aspect is that, yes, we'd like to prepare people for some, for what they're going to face, but you mustn't give away that's where they're going. I have to say, for a potential of a rabbit hole, I do think that they could have come up with something for the tanks in advance and practice with that without telling everybody about it and just have the devices ready and fix them to tanks later on. I think they maybe could have identified that one in advance rather than having to wait until like a month into the Normandy campaign, then deciding they needed a device for the tank. You would have thought, given all the kind of people we have inventing things for 79th Armour Division, someone might have come up with something if they had seen the terrain of Normandy in the aerial photos and the briefings and said, we need something in advance and then had these things stockpiled in greaseproof paper and then break them out when, uh, when the invasion comes. But that's a, another potential um, uh, uh, rabbit hole. But yeah, so Paul is saying the 43rd Wessex destroyed loads of hedgerows around Canterbury. But now, so, but 
were they there because that's just where they happened to be or were they there because they were trying to replicate a certain terrain? These are the questions that we don't know that we have the answers to that we'd love to find out about whether the answers are. I mean, yeah, it, as, as Paul said there, we're, we're enjoying this discussion, but we're realizing how how that little there is written about it and how much more work there is to be done on this subject because it is intensely fascinating. But I think you hit the nail on the head there, Ben. The point of what we're trying to do for our men be they American, British and Canadian, is give them the tool, the basic tools, the basic tools of you know how to get out of landing craft quickly, you know how to get from a ship to a landing craft, you know how to assault a beach, you know how to assault a fixed position, and then allow your leadership on the battlefield to deploy those training movements within the environment and the conditions and the problems you face. I think that's the... And we can, we can say that because we did manage to kick the Germans' ass in Normandy, Overall, the Allies must have done a pretty good job of that. You know, well done. They, they did that. The training was successful. Yeah, and no doubt there were areas that they, they would look back on uh, and change. Uh, but overall, yeah, the training allowed them to get that foothold on the continent of Europe. Yeah, and, you know, again, I want to make stress, if anyone's got any more information about some of the, the, the things we've brought up and not been able to perhaps answer your comments exactly, we'd, we'd, love, to, we'd love to hear what you have to say because, you know, we're, we're, as I said, we, we realised there was not as much information about this th than we hoped there would be. But all in all, um, I think the area that I really want to get to grips with and understand more is, is, the, um, is a site up in Scotland. I think there's... There's a potential book there. Given that 250,000 men went through there, I think there's definitely room for someone to investigate that and do some more work and see if somewhere in the archives there are training programs there about exactly what these men went through um, and how it was organized and what the objective objectives and the purposes were. But that's for the day. In order to wind down today's show, one of the things we're going to finish up with, and someone that I did mention is, is of course, casualties now we know that exercise tiger resulted in over 900 american deaths uh from my research 98 american servicemen died at woolacum over the course of a couple of months you what you've done some research into well we had we've had the fritton fritton lake accidents fritton lake. there so yeah. what, what other ones have you found uh exercise uh eagle in may two dakotas mid-air collision with the uh, the crew and the paratroopers that was the 101st and 82nd involved in that so uh, two sticks uh, being killed in that mid-air collision uh, exercise smash the fourth and seventh raw dragoon guards six uh, i believe they're valentine dd tanks uh, sunk out at, uh, at sea on the way into the beach. I think that was being observed at the time by Churchill Eisenhower. Uh, and the majority of those crews were killed uh, there. Uh, 4th of April, a uh, Stirling bomber with a horse being towed. The Stirling hits a tree in bad weather. So the crew of, I think it's five or six crew in the Stirling and then a whole platoon in the horse are killed uh, just from the brief look I, I have had a look at minimum you're probably numbering 2,000 with paratroopers that jump with shoot failures uh, live firing uh, incidents uh, landing on beaches for exercises where artillery rounds are coming short naval fire uh, landing on friendly troops uh, it wasn't uh, a walk in the park, the training. They obviously walked away with uh, numerous and multiple casualties across the whole... Uh, whole. Uh, it was spread between all the units is probably the easy way to, to say it. There's no unit uh, that did or didn't have any that... Uh, the majority, we just said, exercise tiger. Uh, yeah, I mean, and this is this is where, like with the Normandy Monument, the new British one going up at Versum uh, that lists all the British and, uh, killed in Normandy, is where do you start? Do you, do you, where, how much before D-Day do you count the Navy guys, the, the guys killed in, you know, bombing missions over Normandy? Are they part of the D-Day to Normandy total? Are they not? It's defining your parameters. Now, we, we said before going live, Ben and I, that Peter Caddick Adams, who wrote, of course, Sand and Steel, 
he comes up with the figure 5,440 Allied soldiers killed in training exercises and training flights leading up to Operation Overlord. I did send him a message earlier. Um, he hasn't, because he's obviously busy today, to try and uh, get his parameters for that, because we don't know at what point he starts that count off, because at what point in 42 and 43 are training flights just training flights at what point do they become training flights specifically for overlord because i don't know quite how he's he's got that figure the point he's making is that for people who think that d-day was costly and of course something like four and a half thousand allied soldiers died on d-day we've got to remember that whether it's two thousand or whether it's five thousand a significant number of allied soldiers died in preparation for overlord and that is worth considering and what uh, is interesting is that the names of these people will not be on the Normandy monument. Now, maybe some people say that's that's right. If they weren't killed in Normandy, they shouldn't be on the Normandy monument. But the new Normandy monument, I've been there and looked at, does not mention or even have an information panel that says, please not forget, let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, visitors to this site, that men had died in the training for Overlord. And I think there should be something there that should say that. What's your feeling on that, Ben? See you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, yeah, put me on the spot. Uh, I, the date range is full stop. Uh, I think we're uh, kind of short. You still have fighting going on in Normandy, especially around La Havre, uh, exactly. Op Op Estonia, uh, where men, British Canadians, uh, are being killed still in Normandy that aren't on that memorial. Um, I think this is a whole different. I mean, I, I'm glad. I'm glad there's a monument going up acknowledging that lots of British people died in Normandy. And I think I'm behind the general concept of it, and I think it's a welcome addition, broadly speaking, to our understanding of Normandy. I just think that some explanation about how they drew those figures would be nice for us geeks who like that kind of information. I think something where the but they haven't finished it. Maybe there's gonna be a visitor center that explains how they've drawn the character these figures how they've established it i don't know but i it, the thing is it's a it's an interesting subject that that's open for debate but yeah the point is thousands of men and women died in the preparation for normal and apologies folks for people so you know we, we're not going to get into slaps and sands tonight because it absolutely deserves a, a, a show of its own um, it, it's too much of a subject to cover. I will cover it at some point. I thought about doing it in April on the anniversary. It just didn't happen. Other things were doing other shows then. But I will at some point bring someone on or more than one person and we will get to grips with Exercise Tiger. Both, I think, the actual events and also look at the supposed cover up of it and how and the historiography, I think, of Exercise Tiger is equally interesting in this in this how it has been forgotten and then remembered again and now memorialized and how over the course of 70 odd years exercise tiger has gone from being something that kind of very few people knew about to everybody knows about there's even a plaque on utah beach referencing the exercise tiger now and then of course you have the one in in suffolk um uh, shingle street where there was a training accident there where they were experimenting with um, kind of an, uh, flammable pipes going out under the sea that ignited. This was to stop a German invasion, and during practice by British troops, a number of British soldiers burnt to death on a beach in Suffolk in, was that 42 or 41, 40? I'm Gosh. Not sure the exact date of that. Anyway, there's another show in that. So honestly, uh, Exercise Tiger, as as this incident, Shingle Street, are deserving of their own show. So we're not going to go down that rabbit hole tonight because there's just too much discuss. But in general, I think we've done a pretty good stab at trying to get across some of the types of uh, of training installations that were used before D-Day with the understanding that, like everything else we discuss on World War II TV, there's a myriad of potential future shows about any one of these things we, we mentioned tonight. We could go down into more detail. So... With that, I think we'll bring it to end. So I'll remind people what got coming up, and I'll say goodbye to you in a second, Ben. So that was part two of Build Up to D-Day Week. Tomorrow night, the incredible Dr. Helen Fry is coming on to talk about the role of intelligence in gathering information about the, the D-Day landing. So we've looked at aerial photography. Helen, we talked about the role of MI9 particularly. So this is the bugging of German prisoners of war. This is the intelligence we got from captured Germans. This is the work MI9 were doing with escape lines in France. Basically, Helen is giving us um, 
information from three of her books. And if you haven't discovered Helen's books yet, they are amazing. Her MI9 book is particularly good, but they're, they're all good. So Helen's coming on to give us her, her experience about that aspect. And then on Thursday, Nick Stanley is coming on to talk about mind sweeping, which will be incredibly interesting, talking about just exactly how we cleared the channel to get 7,500 ships across to Normandy for Operation Overlord. And then on Friday, Matt Bone is coming on to talk about the destruction of the radar sites prior to D-Day. So five really good shows we've had for you this week, and then it gets into the exciting stuff for D-Day. So, Ben, as usual, your research is impeccable. Your information, your documentation that you provide is always sensational. So thank you very much. And like myself, I think you've just realized this is another subject that requires more study. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's getting in those archives and looking at the real detail and breakdown of what uh, what these locations were really for and the routine of this training. Yeah, absolutely. So, and again, there's been lots of great lively conversations in the sidebar there. If people have got more information about training, please let us know. Perhaps we'll start a thread on Twitter about it or something. But you know, next time you're reading a book about a unit, your favorite unit, whether it's the American 4th Division or the 70th Tampa Tide or the British 49th Division, and it has that little chapter that says, and we trained in England, just stop and have a think about that and think about exactly how complicated that was and how there's a whole branch of study that has yet to be done because that's what I found out. This 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 needs some more work to, to, to understand how well prepared our soldiers were for that invasion and not just Normandy, Torch and Salerno and Anzio and all the other operations around the world because with practice makes perfect, the title of the show there. So thank you very much, Ben. I will see you again. As for everybody else, check out Ben. Ben is uh, leading a tour for Ledger Tours and Paul Reed works for Ledger. Ledger are... Uh, gradually getting back into touring again post-COVID, and they have an exceptional tour that takes you to some of the pre-D-Day sites, places like Portsmouth and Hailing Island. Island. So contact Ledger Tours and find out about that. Led by Ben, Paul Reed is involved in that because Ledger are doing some amazing things, taking people to battlefields that are otherwise beyond the reach of certain people, and you have expertise of, of Ben's caliber there telling you about those sites. So look into Ledger's Tours. And I will see you all again tomorrow for Dr. Helen Fry. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm off to have a beer. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Ben. Bye.